Just a clarification of, uh, for those that uh, we haven't spoken before. I am an archaeologist, but I also teach back home uh, uh, history of religions and comparative religions, and uh, of course classical and ancient civilizations. So I thought it might be a new perspective uh, to, to this whole context if I take aside uh, for a moment the, the, the archaeological record and speak of a long durée presentation of, of the identities of the region. For the, for the aims of uh, this presentation, I will look uh, at uh, uh, Cilicia in the wider region or, or, or extended region of Southeast Anadolia, which would include uh, uh, the developments of, uh, of Cappadocia and, and, and the na neighboring uh, area that we uh, used to call uh, Comagene. Um, what, what is of a, of a great interest for me from the aspect of development of, of identities and, and development of or transformations in religions uh, is the, the tiny kingdoms that uh, uh, had very, very uh, fragile structure but also led to creation of, of great ideas that would have uh, implications out of their uh, uh, very fragile and small structure. In this context, uh, Eastern and Southeastern Anadolia for me is a, is a very interesting case study where we can actually analyze the, the importance of identities and, and perceptions in the study of the classical past uh, and the importance of identities and, and uh, perception in the classical past as well. What is very important and what we can see from Eastern and South Eastern Anadolia is uh, the re uh, reassembling in our minds of the uh, peculiar, peculiar phenomena that we uh, ev everyday contrast, which is the, the classicism, the Hellenization, the Romanization, Orientalism, Persianism, or Orientalization. As archaeologists, as historians, we frequently use the terms, and in most of the cases, uh, it is very complex to, to give a right definition. And this case study might be an interesting point to redefine or to rethink the whole context. And this is, Southeast and East Asia is very important out of uh, two important uh, reasons. One of that is being the original topos or related to the original topos in Roman context of being Oriental and being, uh, and Orientalism as a concept. Why was that important? Out of two reasons. Number one, Rome approached uh, Cilicia or approached uh, southeast or east uh, Anadolia in a period when Rome was already dominant in the central or the core part of the Hellenistic world. In the previous centuries, the relation to the east of the early Roman elites was a relation of admiration to the east, admiration of the great monarchs. But later on in the first century, when they approached Eastern Asia, it was a situation when they had already conquered the big powers of the Hellenistic world. So the, the very semantics of the world, Orient and Oriental, changed at the, at the position when they came into the Eastern and Southeastern Anadolia. More importantly, uh, uh, Romans or, or uh, uh, Roman uh, uh, war legions came to Southeastern Anadolia in what we call usually post-Mitridatis period. And this is important because already in the Mithridatic and, and Tigranes the Great period, what happened in Rome was a confrontation which was more than a war, but what we like to call in a contemporary context a war of hearts and minds uh, of the Mediterranean. Why? Because these new guys, newcomers like Mithridates or Tigranes, they came with some new resources in the global uh, competition. But their, their premises, their ideology was, was truly Hellenistic. So in their context, in, in Roman context, what Rome was very much uh, afraid of was the concept of coming of uh, Mithridates or, or uh, common leaders as new Alexander, as new uh, Antiochus or new Seleucus Nicator, that actually had a great appeal not just for the elites in the, le in the East, but also in, uh, among many elites in the Mediterranean, which were already um, uh, 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 part of the Roman Empire, and some of them already growing influential. 
So what Romans had to do in their war in societal propaganda, they had to change these leaders in their perspective coming from Eastern and Southeastern Anatolia, from new Alexanders, new global rulers, to something else, which was actually an ultimate Oriental, a Persian, a, a different person or the other, which spoke more of the Roman identity than, to the south, than about Southeastern identity. What is very important for us to know, and we usually underestimate, is that while the Romans in the post-Mitridates period approaching Southeast Anatolia perceived many of its local elites like the remnants of the defeated Orientalism or the otherness that we now own, actually this region had a pre-Roman identity that would endure during the Roman times. And this is an aspect that we should remember analyzing this region. And what was this pre-Roman pre context? We have to remember that while in the early Roman times, this region was on the very edges of the Roman world, actually in the Hellenistic context, uh, Southeast Anatolia was, in, as a wider region, and Eastern Anatolia was uh, quite, quite central. Why is that? Because, for example, Cilicia and Comagena were uh, bordering northern Syria which was actually, from an a, from a ideological point, from the aspect of elite population, the center of the Hellenist, one of the Hellenistic empires. Or, on the other hand, as, as our colleague said, Cilicia and, Cy uh, uh, and Cyprus were on the very edge where, where uh, forces uh, coming from the Mediterranean, from, not just from Mediterranean, but also from the Atlantic or the Indian Oceans, were confronting in the global confrontation between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies. So these guys were in the center, and they were the typical, and, and Cappadocia is even more interesting case, and they were a typical representative of the Hellenistic imperial model. And what model would that be? It is a model built upon the um, Middle Eastern imperial model that existed uh, centuries, if not millennia, before the Hellenistic rulers, but with a slight change. The change was due to the realities after the Ipsus battle, where this uh, world politically fragmented. However, what we should remember is that this world was politically fragmented, but not ideologically fragmented. What we have to remember is that any Ptolemaic or, or Seleucid or even Antigonid leader was actually a new Alexander ruler of the world, of the United Universe. He was not a ruler of Syria or Egypt. So in that ideology, we are changing towards a world that I usually, uh, usually title as a model of multiversal rule. What does it mean? These people were living in parallel universes where they were all descendants of, of Alexander and his global empire and parallelly not taking care of the other leader. And actually, in every next contact, they were increasing their credentials. If, for example, a Seleucid leader would win the Ptolemies, they would again say the global leader, new Alexander, ruled this or that. Or if he lost, he would get a Ptolemy princess. And then again, this increases the, the credentials. And then we come to a crucial post Hellenistic context, which is very important for us. And that post-Hellenistic context is actually the context that the Romans created crashing the big empires. This is the first century uh, BC, first century AD, the gradual intervention of Rome in Southeast Anatolia. What was important for this period? One of the important things of the post-Hellenistic system were the adjustments made in the Hellenistic system by Antiochus the Great. Well, this incidence or precedence uh, existed very early, even in the third century, when the Cappadocians were given the first imperial princes. What changed in the second century was that Antiochus the Great actually translated it from an incident to a general policy. The policy was that in the final urge to reunite the world under his lead, he actually gave a new path for entrance of the local elites he transformed it into a policy where the imperial princesses were given and thus 
the local rulers and the ro local elites were actually introduced to the, to the Hellenistic world. And that's how we come to the uh, claims, the universalistic pretensions of people like Mithridates of Pontus or Tigranes, or later in the Roman period, elites of Cappadocia, uh, Comagena, and even Sicilia. So these are not some crazy guys that invented something of themselves. It was a system that actually functioned in the wider Hellenistic Koine. And just for a change, let's turn the subject in a post-Hellenistic Rome. How many of you are familiar with the donations of Alexandria? Anyone knows? OK, perfect. So just for a minute, it's a more complex theme, but let's understand what the, Hellena what the donations of Alexandria meant for the Romans and for Cleopatra or the Hellenistic rulers. Actually, the Romans were given the same deal as the Eastern local elites. See, uh, for example, in that context, the Pompeia, Caesar, or Mark Antony would actually be very likened to a new diocese or new Heracles and would be very common as a Hellenistic leader. However, even Caesar, that was proclaimed God in the local context on the edges of the Hellenistic world in Rome, did not have a right to be the new Alexander, or in, at least in the Hellenistic context, he could not be the new Hellenistic ruler. But his sons or daughters that has the bloods of Seleucids, Antiochus, or Alexander himself, or the Argeats, they could be the global ruler like new uh, uh, Alexander's, uh, Alexander the Sun, or Alexander Helios, or Cleopatra Selena. Now we come to a moment when we question ourselves, who is more legitimate in, for the global throne of Alexander in the post hellenistic concept? Antony's children with Cleopatra or the local princes of Comagena or, or, or uh, Cappadocia? That's, that explains the mental set, the way these local leaders were thinking. And in, somehow it makes much more normal that Antioch, Antiochus Theos of Comagena was celebrated in his small petty kingdom as a global ruler, as new Alexander, as new uh, Persian king. Why? Because on the end of the day, he was much more legitimate than uh, Alexander Helix, uh, because he had few bloodlines connected to the global empire. And on the end of the day, we have to remember that the, that the Eastern elites, like the Cappadocians or other uh, uh, Anatolian elites, were actually given this free pass into the Hellenistic imperial koine two centuries before the Roman warlords, the Roman general. Now, let's fast forward for a second and see what happened with these consequences on the global Roman world. I, will, I just tried to patch few things which happened. Number one, for a second, with the incident in uh, Actium, the local Roman elites felt safe under the early uh, imperial policies that they are protected. Their conservative local culture stayed there and they didn't integrate totally in the wider Hellenistic world. However, in the Mediterranean, things have been changing rapidly. Even the next uh, Julian or, or uh, leaders already acted as Hellenistic uh, rulers, as Hellenistic uh, dynasts in many of the things. Then, when we speak about, which is very particular, Southeast Anadolia, we usually go back to the Spasian, which actually integrated this region into the Roman Koine, into the Roman world. But what we have to bear in mind is that he also reintegrated Rome in the Hellenistic world. Why? He was, he was put in Rome as empire by the elites of Eastern, Southeastern Anatolia, and, and, the, and the Eastern Mediterranean. In, in the time of his dynasty, actually the Hellenistic, universalistic, and ruler-related cults took over the empire. And this is the, 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 the uh, connected with Isis and, and Serapis cults and many others, including a very important cult of Mithraism, which actually has very close connection to Southeast Anatolia, and actually had a great success among elites that were not exposed to the Hellenistic culture, but were important part and will be important part in the, uh, in the late Roman times. 
What is very important is the third century that with our classicistic uh, thoughts, we understand as the, as the end of the classical Rome. But in fact, one thing that happened in the, in the Seleucid reforms or ideological reform is that the kings or, or the emperors didn't want, didn't need to act as Alexander. They didn't need to act as Hellenistic dynasties. They were actually, uh, uh, we have Roman empires, they're called Alexander Philippos or they're the holy priest of the, of the Helios Baal. They are by all means a new Hellenistic dynasty. So basically, this, these people are very proud, like the, 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 the Severians, they are very proud of their Hellenistic heritage. They are very proud of their royal blood. And somehow, they are close relatives and connected with the, uh, with the elites that we were talking about in Cappadocia, Cilicia, or, or, or uh, Comagene. And the, the transformation is huge, and we come to a point where uh, at the... At the and at the turn of the fourth century, the, the very empire of Ro emperor of Rome is actually officially seated in Anatolia. And, and the emperor of Rome, for example, Julian, he is the new mistress, like, like the most radical case of imitating the, the Eastern Anatolian uh, elite. And he is uh, recreating his one of the many Alexander style marches towards Persia. What is very important to, to suggest in parallel to the global development is the change of priorities of the local leaders. While Antiochus Theos, let's take him as a first example, had actually practical strength in his kingdom. He was important for the balance of power between the Romans and the Parthians. The later elites of, of the three regions uh, had symbolic kingdoms. So, so their kingdoms practically didn't make, uh, make a lot. They, they didn't have any concrete military importance, but what, what they had is the importance of being officially recognized and legitimate. Uh, legitimate. What does it mean? They established the new connections with the, uh, with the Ptolemaic line, with the Jewish kingdom, with the Armenian kingdom, and, and even with descendants of Caesar and Augustus. And they were important because they were in the center of this new change of mindset, which was happening in the new Rome, which was not a republic anymore, but it was a global empire, very close with its mentality to the Hellenistic uh, uh, previous uh, uh, empires. So in a way, what we have to ask ourselves is, who won the global battle for the imperial throne? Was that the mighty republic with its general, or the petty kingdoms counting on the legitimacy and continuity of the united world? Well, there is one way to answer the question differently. If we try just for a moment to go out of our Eurocentric and classicistic lenses, we might think that it is obvious that the credentials, traditions, capacities of this centrally positioned elite of the global Hellenistic world were strong enough, at least in the long run, to, to beat the competitors that were coming at the outskirts of the Oikumen. Thank you so much. <laughs>